So first, in functional reactive programming, uh, you have your reactive programming. And this usually we contrast to uh, transformational programming. So a transformational program, oh, excuse me, yeah. a transformational program uh, essentially runs uninterrupted and uh, consumes its input and output uh, at its own pace. And, uh, and, uh, and it eventually finishes. And this is a typical example of these programs are uh, Unix filters. And on the other hand, uh, reactive programs usually deal with an unbounded uh, input, with unbounded inputs to which uh, it needs to uh, react immediately. And uh, we can say that essentially in a reactive program, uh, it's the environment that drives the execution of the program. And typical example of that are GUI programs like uh, web browsers, uh, hardware controllers, uh, and uh, network programs. Um, another aspect of FRP is functional in contrast to imperative. And uh, the reason why this is important is that usually reactive programs are programmed with callbacks and side effects. And uh, if you want to do that, then uh, I will show you what it means on a counter example. So, this counter example is a small GUI uh, that essentially is a counter here that counts up to the value that you have here. And this, uh, this value, you can change it with this stepper widget here, and uh, at any time, you can restart the counter by clicking on this button. And uh, the, the counter just stops whenever it reaches the number of seconds. So, if you try to program that with uh, with uh, callbacks and side effects, then uh, what you get is essentially a program like this. And uh, so basically you would define two reference cells here, <coughs> duration and elapsed, and then you would have a timer that triggers on each second and calls this, uh, this function here, where you update the elapsed time, and then you notify that the elapsed time changed so that the label can, uh, can update to reflect the new value of elapsed. And then you would create a, a, a stepper here uh, with this callback here that whenever the stepper value changes, you set uh, the duration uh, to the new value and you may have to change also the elapsed time if the duration is smaller than the elapsed time that you, you had before. And you have to notify again that uh, this value change. And finally, you have here uh, a callback for the for the button uh, where you just set uh, elapsed to zero. So uh, there are two main problems with this code. The first one is uh, that you need to manually keep track of changes to the elapsed variable and notify the other values that depend on them with this uh, call to function here and here and here. And uh, this is essentially an observer pattern. And the other problem is that uh, if you want to understand what happens with this elapsed variable here, then it's quite tricky. Because uh, it's not defined in terms of an expression like we do in functional programming, but it's defined uh, by indir indirect references to it. To it. And uh, moreover, these, three, these uh, indirect references are scattered among three different body of code. So this makes the code hard to write, hard to, to understand, and hard to maintain. Uh, so this uh, brings us back to the functional aspects that, that we want. So we would like to be able to express this elapsed variable uh, as, a, as, a, as an expression like we do in functional programming. And the other thing that we want is to try to, to automatically keep track of the, uh, of the updates to this uh, elapsed variable. <coughs> um, yeah, so one way of doing that was described in this paper here and uh, by Conal Elliott and Paul Hudak. And uh, essentially what you do is that uh, you introduce uh, two <coughs> new types which are signals and events that represent time variable values. And uh, a signal is a value uh, that, that, uh, that has always, is a, is a value that has always a current value at any point in time. 
uh, example of a signal is maybe the current bounce position or uh, the, current te the current temperature in this room and more generally anything that has state anything that you would put in a reference cell is a good candidate to become a signal uh, and uh, oops, uh, uh, so a signal you can see that you can understand it and, and that's the way you should understand what a signal is as a function from time to values and whenever you give me the current time I apply the function and I give you the current value of the signal um, the other thing that we introduce are events and uh, events uh, represent values that have uh, values only at a certain point in time which we call occurrences and uh, you can see them as uh, functions that uh, go from time to an option time and if you, I give you the current time and you apply the function then you, if you get none there's no occurrence and if you get some there, then there's an occurrence example of events are uh, maybe the response of a server or a mouse click uh, yeah, and uh, the thing to note is that uh, these uh, signals and events are higher order in the sense that they, al they can also carry signals and uh, they can also carry signals and events. And uh, now, instead of, ha of using explicit mutation, for example, to, say, to set the, the value of the signal, what we do is that we use combinators. Uh, so combinators allow you to derive new events or new signals from previously defined ones. And, uh, so, um, and the idea is that the, the new combinators that you, you define that depend on other signals, they update automatically when one of the underlying signal changes. And uh, so I, oops, uh, uh, I have these examples here. So for example, the, the e.map combinator returns an event, this one, that has exactly the same occurrences as those, that are, uh, as those of the event that is given in the argument, except that they are transformed by this function. The s.map does the same thing, but on signals. So, this signal here is exactly this signal, except that it's transformed by this function. And the s.hold uh, combinator uh, is a signal that remembers the last value, the last occurrence of this event. And since a signal needs to be defined at every point in time, we have to initialize it with a value, which is this argument. So now that we have this, uh, these new types and combinators, we can go back to uh, our counterexample. And uh, so that's how we would express it. So our button here, uh, instead of using a callback, would return an event that has occurrences whenever the button is clicked. This is this restart variable here. Um, the stepper would return a signal that always holds the current value of the stepper. Uh, and the timer would return a second signal that uh, holds the current time in seconds in the, in the signal. So now we can express this elapsed variable as follows. So the first thing we need to, 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 to derive is the last time the button was clicked. So to do that, uh, we use this sample combinator here, which uh, whenever the restart event occurs, which means the button is clicked, samples the second signal. And this gives us an event which holds the last time the button was clicked. And since we want to remember that, we use the hold <coughs> combinator, which gives us this T0 variable here, which, holds, which is a signal which holds the, current, the, the last time the button was clicked. And now we have everything we need to define the elapsed variable. We have the duration, we have the start time of the counter, and the current time in seconds. So now the, the computation of the, of the, the elapsed value <coughs> is defined by this function here. But this function, it acts on, uh, on uh, regular integers. Uh, I mean, it, it, if, you, if you want, it acts on the current value of the signal. So we need to lift it to the time domain, which is the purpose of this combinator here. Uh, you can see this L3 combinator is like math 
before function of three arguments. And uh, so now we have our elapsed signal here, and uh, whenever duration seconds or T0 changes, then automatically elapsed uh, is updated. And now this elapsed, we can, for example, give it to our label, so that the label gets automatically updated when one thing changes in the system. So now, if you are interested by this approach, then, uh, then you may want to have to look at uh, React. Uh, so, what is React? React is uh, an FRP engine. Uh, it's made uh, of a single module, BSD license, and it depends only on the standard library. Uh, and React provides you three things. The first thing it, provi it provides you is uh, combinators. The second thing is uh, a way to create primitives. I'll go back to that later. And the third thing it provides you is the automatic updates of the signals and uh, events. So, about the primitives. So, so far I have only shown you combinators. And combinators, they are just functions. They just allow you to, to uh, build uh, new signals for, or events from previously defined signals. At a certain, certain point, you need a real signal, a ground signal. And these signals, uh, I call them primitives. And uh, uh, React gives you these two, oops, uh, gives you these two functions here to create primitives. So e.create create creates an event here, and it returns you also a function here. And uh, whenever you call this function, then it generates an occurrence uh, on this event. And uh, in this call to the, to the function here, everything will update, all the dependence on this event will update in the reactive system, and whenever the call returns, the system will be up to date. The same is true, the same is true here for signal, except that this, uh, this function here allows you to set the current value of the signal. And, uh, here again, since signals need to be defined at every point in time, we need to give uh, an initial value. Um, yeah, so now you will, you will tell me, but uh, hey, this is, the, this is the type of a callback, right? And uh, yeah, of course, the, the world is ugly, and at a certain point you need to interface with the world. And uh, that's the way uh, we do it. So, for example, here, uh, I want to show on the stepper widget how you would uh, express its current value as a signal. So, basically, you would just create a signal here and uh, use the set function as the callback to the stepper. And that way, uh, whenever uh, the stepper changes its value, it will be reflected in this SVAL uh, signal. It will automatically be up to date. And uh, more generally, about the, the structure of your program, you will want to uh, separate it in two different parts. One that I call here I.O. that uh, interfaces with the, with the world. And uh, basically what that means is that uh, it uh, expresses the world as a set of uh, events and signals and uh, updates these primitives which correspond to this arrow, which will run the FLP system. And uh, it needs also to make sense out of the output of the FLP system to propagate changes back to the world. Um, and then here you have the FLP uh, uh, world, where you try to make sense of the world as described by signals and events and eventually computer response to, to what, what you, you need. So one possible uh, structure, but it's not the only one, but basically is to first uh, define your primitives here in your program, then define derived signals and events, and then you have an infinite loop that just updates the primitives. Uh, oh, the counter didn't count. Uh, so I would just like to talk about this, uh, this small uh, uh, thing here. If you want the FRP system to, uh, to uh, react to himself, you just have to be a little bit careful uh, because you are not allowed here to call a new primitive. If you need to do that, then there are two solutions. Either you use fixed point combinators 
in which case there is no real problem. Uh, or if you really need to call a primitive at the end of your, of your FRP system, then uh, you need to put the call uh, into a queue and let the, the update finish and uh, dequeue the queue later. Um, so, now, uh, does that save us? I don't know, but uh, because I have no real uh, I have no real experience with large FRP programs, and it's true that it's a kind of different kind of programming. But the, my only message today is that if one day you get stuck into uh, side effects and callbacks, then you may just want to give it a try. So this is the, the address where you can download the software, this is the address where you can download the slides, and uh, before getting to the questions, I would just like to mention that there are two other solutions to do FRP in OCaml, which are FROC and Concurrent Cell, and more generally uh, in other languages, which, which can also be uh, interesting if you're looking to design uh, FRP APIs, then you, you, you have here a page that collects many Haskell implementations, uh, here for JavaScript, Scala, Scheme, and uh, that's it. Let's go to the questions, if there's any. Um, uh, this may be a silly question. How does it garbage collect sort of his the history of events? Does that happen? There's no history because uh, the underlying implementation is imperative. An, in, an imperative hell. He <laughs> did that for us. Yes. <laughs> there, there is a well-known um, memory leaks uh, problems uh, in FRP libraries in Haskell. Yeah. Uh, do, do you have uh, the, the same issues, or is there a specific? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> Because we uh, in the because when you use the combinator, basically what you are what you are building is a graph of data de dependencies, okay? And uh, uh, in this graph, I use weak references mm -hmm. to the to, uh, to 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 the to the to the dep to your dependence. And uh, if if your uh, if your signal is not used anymore, then it's garbage collected. Okay, so you claim that. Weak references are uh, plugged, uh, resolve the problem. Yes. Okay. They're actually useful for that. Thank you. Yeah. No, so there are no memory leaks, no. But, yeah, this, is, this may not be the case in all implement <coughs> implementations, but. How does your library compare to active ML from uh, Riemandel? Uh, I don't know, uh, I know the name reactive ML, but. Uh, but uh, I have, it's not a library, ReactiveML, right? it's, a, it's a language, so uh, uh, to be honest, I've never looked into uh, ReactiveML. Could you give more details on the, the tricky part you mentioned at the end? Uh, with uh, the, the beware here? This? Yep. Yep. So, so basically, when you go from here to here, you are invoking a primitive, okay? And uh, and um, uh, usually, this primitive will trigger a lot of activity, uh, which I call an update cycle. And uh, in this uh, update cycle, uh, you are not allowed. Uh, because in an update cycle, you, you can perfectly perform side effects. For example, if I use the s.map combinator, the function that I use is allowed to perform side effects. You should, you should not do that because it's not clean. You should do it only at the end to feedback again into here. But if, if you do, so, so it's, it's perfectly possible uh, that you try in one of these side effects to uh, update another primitive. And that is explicitly disallowed. That's the only thing you, you don't have the right to do.
Okay, thank you very much. Um, 